Let's talk about Monte Carlo methods. Monte Carlo methods are all about one kind of thing, and that is estimating expectations. These expectations could be integrals. They could look like this, where we have some thing I'm going to call a target distribution pi of x with probability density function pi of x. So they could be things like this, and this we would say is an expectation, I'll say under pi of x, of the function f of x. It could also be that we're estimating sums. So it could be that x takes values in the discrete space, and so we're going to sum over the possible values of x, and pi is now a probability mass function, and f is something that is consuming discrete values. We would still call this an expectation. What I'm going to talk about applies to both of these cases, but I'm going to focus on the top one because everything I say about this for the most part will translate in a fairly obvious way to the discrete situation. The Monte Carlo principle is the idea that if I have an integral like this, that is an expectation, and I can draw samples. So I'm going to say, I imagine that I can draw samples from pi. So I'm using this notation to say that I'm drawing some independent samples xn from the distribution pi then I can approximate this with a sample average. So I'm drawing n of them, big N. So from little n, there's one to big N. Now, this is an intuitive thing because you're used to averaging things already. It's generalizing it to the idea that we can find the expectation of arbitrary functions under this distribution pi. So this is what we call the Monte Carlo principle. This annoying integral, perhaps I can't do in closed form. Perhaps for whatever reason, it's not possible to use traditional quadrature methods. So things like Gaussian quadrature, maybe it's too high dimensional to be able to do that. And so what I do is I get a noisy estimate in which I draw samples from pi and I take those samples, plug them into f and then average them. I should say, that it might look like this kind of thing is obscure and that it doesn't come up very often. It turns out that this kind of integration, this kind of expectation is something that comes up many, many different places in machine learning and statistics and all across the physical sciences and in economics. We're computing expectations like this all the time. This could be something like, imagine that you have a simulation on the stock market tomorrow and f of x is how your portfolio does. Well, you'd like to know under all possible ways that the market might go tomorrow how much money am I likely to make? Or maybe pi of x is representing in your self-driving car the possible situations that might arise at the next intersection. And you'd like to make a good decision that takes into account all the possible states that that intersection might be in. Well, you might want to find the average. You might want to find the expected risk, say, associated with some decision going into that intersection. And that will be, again, an expectation. And so averages seem like simple objects, and in some ways they are, but we use them absolutely everywhere, and they can be very challenging to compute precisely because they involve integrals over perhaps high-dimensional complicated spaces with distributions that might be difficult to manipulate. If we can draw samples from those distributions, then we can get averages and use those as proxies for the exact computation of the integral. An important thing about this is that Monte Carlo estimators are unbiased. What that means is that if you do this procedure in expectation, you will get the right answer. That is to say, averaging the averages tends to converge to the truth. Let's take a couple of minutes and convince ourselves that this is an unbiased estimator. That just means that when I take the sample average, if I imagine the sample average of sample averages, that is what would happen if I do this many times, I need that to average to the truth. So recall that the game we're playing is we're trying to compute the expectation now under this funny thing I'm going to write under the set of samples we might get with our Monte Carlo estimator and I'm going to be looking at the sample average under those guys. So it's a little bit weird because it's kind of like I'm taking my average estimator and I'm sticking it inside another estimator in order to reason about it. Okay so this is just a sample average over the samples xn. And I'm asking what happens under all possible xn's that I might get. And I just want to make sure that that gives me the integral that I want to compute. That is, that it gives me the right expectation. Now, the first thing that you notice, of course, is that an expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectation. And so I can immediately go in and I can replace this with a 1 over n, sum equals 1 to n, now of this expectation on the inside. So now let's write this out just to see what's going on here. So 
we'll write our 1 over n sum over n over little n. I often like to use a lowercase letter as a dummy index summing up to the uppercase version of that. Then I can keep track of what index corresponds to what quantity. Now I'm going to need to, to write down the integral for this expectation. And so I'm going to introduce some dummy variables that I'm going to call x prime just to make them different from these other ones. And in particular, we note that that expectation is a multiple integral over all of the xn's, right? So what that means is that I'm going to have, say, a pi. I said I'm going to use a dummy variable for prime there, like that. And I've got one of them all the way out, of course, including xn. And then capital N. So this is an expectation under all of those pi's. And so I have a big product representing the independence of those pi's. But then there's only one f of xn. Now that looks like a complicated and annoying expression, except that we know because all of the pi's are probability density functions, they all integrate to one. And so all of these x primes, except for this one, can easily go away. Because when we integrate them, they just become one. So now I only have one integral that I have to care about. And that is going to be pi x prime of little n, f applied to that, and then only that one. Now, notice that this is exactly the quantity that we're trying to compute. This is the expectation under pi of f of x. And when I take a sum over n of them, I get n copies of that constant, right? It doesn't depend on n. And then I divide by big N, and I get the thing I'm interested in. Now this isn't too surprising. It's just sort of saying the averages of averages have the same expectation. A little bit more interesting is the variance. So now let's think about the variance. So we're going to say, I'm going to write it like this. I'm just going to say the variance, again, under this collection of variables of this quantity, this average. So just like last time I looked at the expectation, now I'm going to write the variance under the possible samples we might get. Now the very first thing to notice is that there's this constant 1 over n. Now, whenever we talk about the variance of a random quantity multiplied by a constant, that constant can come outside the variance, but it comes outside as the square. That means I can write this as 1 over n squared multiplied by the variance still over that collection, but now over the sum only. I've taken these to be independent variables xn. And so when I have independent things and I ask about their variance, then it's going to be the sum of their individual variances. So that's good news. We can write this out as 1 over n of the sum of each of their variances. Now, by the same kind of argument we had before, there's only one xn that's appearing inside, and so I can focus on just the variance of that xn, the variance with respect to that xn of this guy fxn. There's nothing special about xn relative to the other x's, this variance is the same over all of the individual samples. This is kind of the one sample variance, if you will. And so then this means that I can have a 1 over n. I could just write this as 1 over n. Sorry, we need squares here. That's important. Of the variance under pi of f of x. So these are the same from our point of view because all of the xn's come from that pi distribution. Note that this now really doesn't depend on n. And we see immediately that what happens is one of those n's cancels out and we wind up with a 1 over n multiplied by the variance of pi. This is a thing that doesn't depend on n at all, right? This is the variance of one of these samples. But as n increases, this quantity goes down as 1 over n. So the takeaway here is that the variance of a Monte Carlo estimator goes as 1 over n, where n is the number of samples. As I increase the number of samples, the variance is going down linearly. That sounds like good news, and in some ways it is, but variance, remember, is kind of the square of our error, in a sense. 
it's not the actual error itself. So this means the kind of error of our Monte Carlo estimate is kind of going as one over root n, which is a little bit of bad news because that means as I invest more samples, my error is going down, but I'm getting diminishing returns. This means that it costs more and more in order to get a better answer. Now, the idea of Monte Carlo estimation relies a lot on your ability to generate data from a particular distribution. That is to say that the expectation we're interested in really requires being able to sample from pi. Now, in the last video about random number generation, we talked a little bit about how to sample from general probability distributions. It can be the case that we want to generate Monte Carlo samples from pretty complicated distributions, and a lot of the work that we put into random number generation often goes into computing Monte Carlo averages. For complicated probability distributions, I mentioned ideas like rejection sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo. But in the specific case where you're going to use those random samples to compute an expectation with Monte Carlo, it turns out that you can use a really interesting trick called importance sampling. So remember, the idea here is that we have some expectation under a distribution pi of some function f of x. So pi is a distribution on x, and we're looking at the expectation of this function. So if this is continuous, then we would write something like this. You know, there's some space x, we have pi, and we have x. Then the idea is that if we draw some samples, say n of them, from the distribution pi, then we can approximate this with an average. Okay, so this is straightforward, but it does require that we be able to generate samples from pi. The idea of important sampling is to rewrite this integral in a different way. And in particular, we choose another distribution to introduce into this equation. And this distribution, which we often call the proposal distribution, it has a lot in common with the proposal distribution that is that upper bounding distribution that we used in rejection sampling. But here we don't need it to be an upper bound. We just need to know its probability density function and it needs to be something easy to sample from, like a Gaussian, say. And typically we would denote this with a Q. So here I'm writing Q as the probability density function associated with this proposal. The idea is that we can rewrite this expectation by dividing and multiplying by Q. So I can write something like this in place of this. I haven't done anything fancy here. All I've done is divided and multiplied by Q. And as long as Q isn't zero in a place where the original integrand isn't zero, then this is a thing we feel like we can get away with. What's interesting about this is that we've now rewritten this as a different expectation, that is an expectation under Q now, of a different function. That is to say, that we can write it like this. I'm going to write an expectation under q instead of pi of the quantity pi over x, sorry, the quantity pi x divided by qx. So rather than an expectation under pi of f, instead we have a different function that has this extra bit out in front and we're computing the expectation of that function under Q. The idea being that if Q is easier, then we could sample a bunch of values from Q. We just have to kind of fix them up. We have to put in a ratio of pi to Q in order to make sure that they have the right weights. So we usually call these the importance weights associated with important sampling. So to make this concrete, the idea now is that we have some XNs that are drawn from Q. And now this expectation is approximated by a sum of this more complicated thing. So now the object that we're taking the sample average of is a little bit weirder, but the idea is that Q is really easy to compute, and so this is something that we can expect to do. And this sample average has the same expectation as this one. So instead of sampling from pi, we can sample from Q, and life will be easy. One way to think of this is as kind of rejection sampling, but rather than rejecting things outright and throwing them away, we're downweighting them according to how good of a sample they were from pi. You do have to be a little bit careful. In general, we would expect that we'd like Q to be a lot like pi, so that we don't have any kind of really large or really small numbers here. You wanna make sure that there's not some places where you have very small values for Q and large values for pi, or the variance, like we looked at just a minute ago, can explode. It can even go to infinity if you do a really bad job of picking Q. But in general, if you're thoughtful about Q and you pay attention to these kinds of issues, then this can be a really nice shortcut to doing Monte Carlo estimation.